and welcome to Gardener's World. Thanks for joining me again. Now, tonight is incredibly special for me because we have the grandfather of all the people that wrote all these books. Um, any big names you can think of, they're all influenced by this man. So I am honoured and humbled to have him on the show. Now, a long time ago, H.G. Wells, the famous science fiction writer, said that we neglect to teach our children about philosophy. We teach them about the philosopher. We tell him where he came from, um, when he lived, but we don't teach the children about the philosophy. We don't teach them how to think, how to broaden their horizons. And it's a little bit like giving a nurse or a doctor a, a drug, a new drug, um, telling them what it's called and where it came from, but not what to use it for. The guest tonight, Colin Wilson, is a man who has written so many books which tells us all about philosophy, which helps us to open our mind to think in a, in a better way. And he's been highly influential um, to me in particular, so I'm honoured and humbled to have Colin Wilson on the show tonight with his new book, Super Consciousness, which is all about the peak experience, something that, that a lot of people talk about and write about and think about in their own unique ways. But this book, I sat up till one o'clock this morning reading, and it's just a tremendous book, and it's, it's, it's a book we all got to read if we're going to re truly understand what this is all about, the peak experience. So, Colin Wilson, thank you. I am humbled and honoured, sir, that you have joined me on this show. Now, tell us about this book, Super Consciousness. Well, it's basically about an American psychologist called Abraham Maslow, who um, was uh, the head of the American Psychological Association and therefore believed in Freud, but got more and more sick of Freud because he said that um, Freud just talked about negative things and that, in fact, um, most sick people talked about nothing but their sickness yeah. and that he got bored with this. And so he got the interesting idea of asking around to find healthy people and he would ask people, who's the healthiest person you know? And they'd tell him. He got a list of healthy people, you know, about a hundred or so. And then he tried studying them instead. And he quickly discovered something that no one had ever discovered before because no one had thought of studying healthy people. And that was that all healthy people had with a fair degree of frequency what Maslow called peak experiences, just sudden bubbling experiences of sheer happiness. Mm. And uh, once... Uh, this had happened, of course, the question was, why did it happen, and can we make it happen again? Yeah. So when I got this letter from him, I found it fascinating, and I said, well, how do you induce peak experiences? Mm. And he said, well, unfortunately, I can't tell you that. Right. They come when they want to, and they go when they want to, <laughs> and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. So this seemed to me to be I'm rather sad, until he said something that suddenly told me the answer to the question I just asked him. He said that he began talking to his students about peak experiences and that the students began remembering peak experiences they'd had in the past and that they'd more or less forgotten at the time. And then they began reca recalling them again and talking to one another about them. Mm. And as soon as the students began talking to one another about their peak experiences, they began having peak That's experiences happened. all the time. Right. So he'd found the method, in fact, of having the peak experience. It's kind of talking it up. <laughs> well, you focus upon it. Yeah. And that's the main thing, focusing upon it. Mm. And uh, the kind of thing that um, impressed Maslow, one of the students um, was working his way through college as a jazz drummer. Mm. And one morning he said, <clears throat> something like three, three in the morning, he was drumming in a nightclub, and suddenly he could not do a thing wrong. And he went into the peak yeah. experience. Yeah. And he said that all of them had similar experiences. And the most uh, interesting of them was a young mother who was giving breakfast to her husband and kids, and suddenly a beam of sunlight came in through the window, and she suddenly thought, my God, aren't I lucky? and went into the peak experience. Mm. The peak experience is basically the feeling, God, aren't I lucky? Right. And it can occur in all kinds of ways, but what, it, what happens in every case is that you some, simply become conscious 
of something that was there before, because she was lucky before she thought, God, aren't I lucky? Yeah, yeah, sure. And it was suddenly, as it were, putting two cameras on you being lucky yeah. instead of just one she of them. kind of self-aware of the fact. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, for example, uh, there was a Marine who came back um, from the South Seas after spending God knows how many years without ever seeing a woman. And when he came back and saw a nurse back at base, he went into the peak experience. Not anything to do with sex, but because he said, he suddenly hit him. Women are different from men. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you know, we think of women as another kind of man, in a way, another kind of human being. But they're not they're as different from uh, men as horses are from cows. Mm. And he said, you know, it, it suddenly hits you in this powerful way. Right. Now, that is the peak experience, and it's what happens in all good thinking when suddenly something becomes absolutely clear to you. Yeah. So you, have you ever had the peak experience? Once well, or twice? Uh, yeah. Well, it's not just once or twice. You see, I got interested in the whole thing simply because um, peak experiences have been something, fortunately, which have happened fairly frequently in my life. But mostly, I noticed them as a child at Christmas. Everybody does at Christmas. They get into this, this lovely state mm. in which everything seems wonderful. And, of course, the one thing you would love to do is to be able to reproduce them at other times of the year. And this yeah. is the most difficult thing of all. Yeah. This is what got me so interested in peak experiences. So as soon as I saw Maslow talking about peak experiences, something went ping, and I thought, this is what I've been looking for for mm. so long. Mm. So would you relate it at all to religious experience? Um, well, it's a kind of religious experience, all right, but um, it's not necessarily um, an experience of anything to do with conventional religion. What seems to happen is that you suddenly discover the reality of things. Aldous Huxley discovered it when he took the drug mescaline for the first time. Mm. And he said that quite suddenly, looking at anything made him aware of the immense reality of what he was looking at. So that looking at a deck chair made of red and yellow stripes, it seemed to be made of red and yellow fire. Right. And he said everything was like this. He'd look at a table like this one we're sitting at, and simply the light reflecting off the table would strike him as so immensely real mm. that it was the only important thing in the universe. Mm. Now, that is the essence of the peak experience, but of course the peak experience is just basically that sudden feeling of overwhelming happiness. Right. Do people have a, a sense of connection at all to the universe? Do, do they get into a state where it's like a nexus, they want to get back to that point? Well, yes, um, you can do. And um, in fact, uh, one writer about all this called it cosmic consciousness. And what happened in the case of this chap whose name was Richard Morris Buck, is that um, round about 1900, he'd spent an evening sitting with friends, reading their favourite poetry, which included Walt Whitman and, you know, Keats and Shelley and all mm. the rest of it. Uh, and incidentally, Walt Whitman was actually there. And at the end of the evening, he went out and got into a carriage to take him home, when he suddenly thought that there was a fire somewhere, a sort of red glow, and he thought, uh-uh, what's going on? Mm. And then looked around and realised that actually the fire was inside himself. And uh, this got him so interested because he thought there's obviously another type of consciousness completely, mm. a higher level of consciousness, um, which makes us see things completely differently. And th this he called cosmic consciousness. In other words, you're not just conscious of what's going on around you at the moment. You're, uh, this level of consciousness is as much above ordinary human consciousness as human being, human consciousness is above ordinary animal yeah. consciousness. Yeah. Well, now, what a lot of people may be pointing to today is saying the next step in evolution. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And this, this was, is something that I came to believe quite early on, long before I'd come across Maslow. I was giving a talk um, to the Shaw Society in London round about 1957, just after my first book, The Outsider, came out. And... Uh, Somebody asked me a question about consciousness, <clears throat> and I said, I believe that man is on the point of a leap in consciousness to a higher phase. Right. Then I found myself thinking, <laughs> do I really mean that, <laughs> or did I just say it for effect? And I thought about it and thought, no, I really mean it. Mm. And it was sort of like a sudden insight. But these things don't occur to you as flashes of, um, you know, brilliant uh, 
knowledge, they just suddenly occur as a precise and absolute intellectual focus. Mm. It's the kind of thing Sherlock Holmes could have, yeah. as well as anybody else. Right, sort of kind of in intuitive. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that's what interested me so much, how you could actually teach yourself um, to focus the mind sufficiently to get mm. peak experiences. Yeah, because this book is very much a, a kind of self-help to mm. how to get there, isn't it? Mm. You know, I mean... The reason I ask about the religious experience, maybe even the mystical experience, you know, that point where they get a sense of the divine, where they see a greater knowledge, they, they believe they're part of the whole universe and maybe even connect to the whole knowledge of the universe. But it's, it's not the same kind of knowledge that you get out of a book. And you, you know, it's, it's a different kind of knowledge. And there's this sense that they want to go back. So, you know, it, from a religious context, it could also be dangerous, couldn't it? Um, it could be. But in fact, what tends to happen is that we, what we, the discovery we make um, in such moments is that consciousness can be expanded so that it tends to be almost like a series of reflections in a mirror. Mm. In the way that if you let off um, a flare in a room full of mirrors and then got them bouncing back from every point of the room, so to speak, this is rather what it's like. Mm. Um, and this is um, the fascinating thing about cosmic consciousness, that you actually recognise that it's something to do um, with, a, a just rec with, with just feeling yourself um, to be a different person than you ever knew before. Mm. It's like recognise seeing yourself for the first time. Almost like finding the true self <laughs> that well, we're yes, told about. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So does this make any, any differences in the outside world? You know... Does it make any external influences? Does it change anything for people, other than their own actions, maybe, causing those reactions? Well, the, that brings me to an interesting point about this. Whenever I've succeeded in pushing myself by some kind of mental effort um, closer to the peak experience, what tends to happen um, is what Jung called synchronicities. Right. And this um, always happens again and again. So that when I started observing this once, I was writing an article about synchronicity um, for an encyclopedia. And as I was writing the article, I came across an example in, um, about Joan of Arc. And then within minutes looking in something else, came across another example about Joan of Arc. <laughs> and from then on, it just went on expanding until I was coming across... Uh, example after example of synchronicity. Mm. Now, um, the interesting thing was, some of these things were so extreme, so extraordinary, that it was impossible to believe that they were merely coincidence. Mm. I mean, to, to explain to people who don't really know about Jung and don't know that, that he's, oh. he's the guy who, who coined synchronicity, if you like, um, what, what is synchronicity as opposed to coincidence? Ah, well, what Jung actually um, recognised was that suddenly um, the same type of thing tends to happen over and over again. <clears throat> so that um, he'd heard a whole series of comments about um, this, uh, a particular kind of fish, and then a little later on the same morning from a completely different patient, another thing about the same fish, until suddenly it began to strike him that someone was trying to tell him something and that what was trying to tell him something was a, almost as it were fate. Mm. And it's the repetition of this that's so interesting. Mm. Now, um, an American uh, I know called Jacques Vallée, a Frenchman who went to America and got very interested in flying saucers, UFOs. And he also quickly noticed this business about the coincidence or the synchronicity, although they tend to happen again and again. What interested him so much, he said, was that it's almost as if you, um, you had a different system um, of classifying things, rather like a librarian. A librarian, for example, would normally classify things under alphabetical order, and so that if you wanted to find out where some particular book was, you'd simply look it up in the catalogue under the author. But supposing you... Um, Hold it there. 
Chris, we've got ten seconds. And <laughs> Everybody's going to be um, holding their breath right now to find out a bit more about synchronicity as opposed to coincidence. Join us then. Hello, welcome back to Gardener's World. Now, just before the break, Colin was telling us all about the differences between synchronicity and coincidence, and uh, I had to cut him short, unfortunately. Colin, can you take up where you left off? Mm. Yeah, I was saying that a librarian uh, could classify books in two different ways. The obvious way is the way that librarians use, that is to say, to put them um, in alphabetical order, and so on, and then going and looking it up in the catalogue. But there must be a simpler way of doing that, particularly nowadays when we've got um, so much electronic help. Mm. And what um, Jacques suggested was supposing whenever a book came into the library, you simply shoved it on the first shelf and allowed the shelves to expand. But there's something on the back of every book that tells you precisely where it is. And all you have to do um, when you find some... Um, reference that you want and you want to get hold of the book is push a button and it goes beep 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 on the back of a book and a little red light comes on and uh, this would be obviously a different way of classifying things now that was the idea of um, Jacques Vallée because he got fascinated by certain coincidences and synchronicities and uh, he thought there must be something more to all this it's almost as if something outside us mm. is looking down at us and pushing the button at the right moment and making the beep, beep, beep go. Mm. And nearly all people who've experienced a series of synchronicities have had this same weird feeling of being almost picked up, so to speak, and made to look at something yeah. by a force outside ourselves. Yeah. So there's no longer a feeling of, you know, merely our personal selves. Like a friend of mine said recently, it's like synchronicity dumping itself on you. <laughs> yeah. You couldn't avoid it. Everywhere he went, it was hitting him. That's right, That's yes. the kind of thing, mm. yeah. Well, um, in Jacques' case, um, what happened was to do with a biblical prophet called Melchizedek. Mm. And uh, he got very interested in this prophet, um, Melchizedek, but couldn't find a single thing about him. And so um, he looked him up everywhere he could, and then he got um, a taxi in Los Angeles, and his lady taxi driver, when he asked her for um, her name because he wanted a receipt from her, said her name was Melchizedek. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Jacques thought, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And uh, she gave him this receipt, M. Melchizedek. When he got back home, he thought, well, the Los Angeles must be full of Melchizedeks. Looked it up in the L.A. phone directory, which is this high. Yeah. One Melchizedek, his taxi driver. <laughs> so, um, anyway, he was uh, fascinated by this apparent coincidence. Now, um, I happened to be writing about that, and I was writing an article, as I say, about synchronicity. And uh, it was getting late afternoon, and I was yawning, and it was time I took my dogs for a walk. As I got up to go upstairs to the sitting room, I saw lying around on the bed a book that I hadn't seen before, but I knew it was my book because I'd had it specially bound. And um, I, I thought, oh, that's interesting, and took it upstairs with me. It was a book called You Are Condemned to Life by a doctor called Chesney. Mm. And um, once I got upstairs, uh, once I came back from my walk, I opened this book, and the first thing I see is a headline saying, Cult of Melchizedek. <laughs> oh, my God, my hair actually <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> made a funny little electrical feeling. Because <laughs> I suddenly thought, that's a real... It's almost as if someone was telling me about Jacques' um, coincidences mm. or Jacques' um, synchronicities and said, you really want an example of synchronicity? Here's one. Mm. And handed yeah. me this. I mean, I see it sometimes like, um, you know, when you're looking for a new car, um, you'll say, oh, I'll, I'll have one of these. And then suddenly as you're driving around, they're everywhere. It's, 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 it's like, one, you've opened your perceptions yeah. to these things. And so is it, is it like that? Is it, you know, in a universal scale, in a, in a psychological scale? Have we opened our perceptions suddenly to these things? Or 
Well, you see, what's re really interesting is the fact that once you've opened your perceptions to it, it appears to operate on other people. Now, this is the external thing I was trying to get to. Yeah. It doesn't make, cause an effect with others too. That's what I mean. Yeah, it, it's yeah. sort of, it goes like a flash of lightning all around the community. Yeah. Now, I knew about this because it happened to me when I published this first book, The Outsider, which was in 1956. I mean, something's just flashed in mind. You know, as, as a marketing guy, you kind of think to yourself, oh, if this is true, just think of the marketing that you can do with this guy. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting a bunch of people sat together, all concentrating on a product, and synchronicities will occur, and everybody will buy that product. Well, <laughs> it depends upon the peculiar. What you, I'm sure that you could do this in point of fact, get a group of people together. Uh, a peculiar kind of focus, a peculiar kind of intensity. You see, because... I could see with the outsider that what had happened was that quite suddenly everybody was talking about outsiders. Unfortunately, um, it got completely derailed because John Osborne had written a play called Look Back in Anger, which came out the week before The Outsider. Right. The papers weren't sure whether to talk about outsiders or angry young men, and unfortunately, angry young men won out. Right. And so, what I felt in a way, you know, this, this project, I thought, my God, isn't it wonderful? You know, I'm like somebody who's sort of thrown a stone and has actually hit the bullseye the first time. Mm. And then the more time went by, I realised, no, this is just not true. Unfortunately, um, difficulties are thrown in your way and the whole thing is made ten times as complicated as you think. Right. And that is what happened um, with The Outsider. So here I am, 50 years later, <laughs> and still with the same feeling that, uh, you know, Stick with it, and something will happen. And the something that will happen is oddly sort of um, physical in a way. You see, we are apparently at the moment in a time of extraordinary crisis. Mm. Everything seems to be going wrong. And what this tells us, this whole business of synchronicity and um, of the peak experience, is that we can somehow change things. We can make things go right. Mm. How? Well, Maslow had got the answer. As soon as his students began to talk to one another about peak experiences, they began having peak experiences all the time. We'd rather interesting, and I've noticed this if I've talked ever in a lecture about peak experiences, the first thing I notice is that everybody in the, the audience begins to smile. <laughs> and uh, quite obviously, everybody recognises the nature of the peak experience. The realisation that, in point of fact, there is a possibility of making it such a general experience that is, it, it, it would go around the world and change. Mm. We could change civilization. So let's we, start today. You know, all the yeah, people that are watching this show now, <laughs> can we make them all smile at home and with, send this around the world? With the simple idea, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's sort of rather like Uri, Uri Geller, who used to do the same thing on television and make people bend spoons. Mm. This is a bit more useful. <laughs> yeah, rather. <than> that. <laughs> it's making people smile and let's send some positive waves out there because there's an awful lot of negatives, aren't there? There's, I mean, you, you're probably fully aware of the, the 2012 club, people going on about the Mayan prophecies and, hmm. and it's either the end of the world or it's a great enlightenment and we're all going to, you know, everything's going to be saved and it's all going to be fantastic. Let's go for a positive aspect and let's say that, that we can make a change now. Mm. Never mind 2012, never mind some silly date in the future or some date in the past or whatever. Let's make a change now and let's all have this positive experience and peak experience now and then spread that to our family and our friends and, you know, is this, is this, this a good thing? Should we do this? Um, it could be done and what's more, uh, I've been saying that it could be done for 50 years or so. <laughs> and uh, I'm finding it increasingly difficult in a certain sense because... Um, you see, I found myself born in a very negative time, mm. a time of negative philosophy. This negative philosophy had been around, in fact, since around about uh, right after the First World War, mm. when quite suddenly um, it invaded literature in the form of things like T.S. Eliot's Way to Land and Ernest Hemingway's early yeah. novels, and this feeling, you know, that um, quite suddenly the world is, you know, in no Coward's cavalcade, <laughs> a voice towards the end keeps shouting, the world's gone mad, the world's gone <laughs> yes, mad. Yes. And uh, this kind of thing does produce a, a reflection mm. in the society itself. Mm. So if you really want to destroy things, just go around shouting the world's gone mad. <laughs> <laughs> it's all going to end. <laughs> yeah. So can, can peak experiences be used in a positive way, for instance, with people who are neurotic or, or have other 
mental ailments. Oh, very much indeed. I mean, for example, um, a, a friend I knew, an older chap came over to see me one day years ago and said, could I offer him some kind of work? And he said it didn't matter whether I paid him or not. All that he wanted was that he was in such a miserable state that um, he uh, would do anything, you know, just for the sake of putting his mind on something else. And I said, well, I can't actually because I tend to write most of my own stuff and it pours straight onto the typewriter. We didn't have a computer then. Yeah. And uh, anyway, I Good said... Good old days. Sorry? Good old days. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. I, and uh, I said, it, but um, here's my latest book, you know, have a look at this. And I passed on a book called New Pathways in Psychology, which was about Abraham Maslow and peak experiences. Mm. And he came back the following week and said, ah, you bugger, you knew what you were doing, didn't you, <laughs> when you gave me that book? And it, oh, it's quite obviously changed, you know, from being miserable and gloomy, yeah. quite suddenly to change yeah. So the very fact of actually looking into this? It's merely a matter of becoming conscious of something. Mm. I mean, would you have any advice if there are people out there now watching this that are uh, maybe negative? about certain things or, or feeling a little bit low about things and maybe wondering to themselves, well, what is this peak experience? How can I achieve this? Well, yes, but um, what you've got to do is to start off by understanding the way that all this has come about because that's the really interesting question. That's what I've really gone into in this book. Mm. The way that ever since um, around about um, 1873 or something, uh, there has been an increasing tendency to this extreme gloom. And it really, the romantics started this whole idea of getting these ecstatic, wonderful feelings that the whole world is a marvellous place. You know, and Keats and Shelley and all the rest, and William Blake. And then, quite suddenly, round about 1830, it went out like a light, with, partly with the death of Byron and various others. Mm. But quite suddenly, Romanticism uh, turned into something rather bitter and grim and continued in that way um, for the rest of the century and has continued right down until today. Mm. So what we're doing in a way is trying to change something that has been around um, for well over 200 years. Now, um, I've often felt as a writer that this is like some enormous log which lies across the road of civilization. Mm. And that we can't go forward with this log in the way. What we've got to do is to get a bulldozer and bulldoze it out of the way. Yeah. And then everything would be fine. Nice. And uh, I've always believed in this. And I've also recognized that, you know, there's nobody who can do it if, if I don't get the bulldozer mm. and start work on it. You see, you've got to start understanding the way that these things work. What it amounts to is really what I call the Laurel and Hardy theory of consciousness. And what this involves recognizing is that inside you've got two different beings that you could compare to Laurel and Hardy. You know, um, Hardy is the fat one. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Stan, I'm old enough to remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Stan's the, the thin one. Yeah. And uh, what, what actually happens is that you have two people living inside your brain. Mm inside the right and left hemispheres of your brain who correspond pretty exactly to Laurel and Hardy. Mm. Uh, and what happens when you get into these states of extreme happiness is that Laurel and Hardy are actually reinforcing one another. And so that when a child, for example, gets terribly happy on Christmas morning, what happens is something like this. The child wakes up and um, thinks, oh, good, it's Christmas. And then everything tends to reinforce that feeling of, oh, good. You know, the lights on the Christmas tree, mm. the smell of the turkey cooking in the oven, the mince pies, and all the rest of it. And so you can, before the end of Christmas Day, build yourself up into a state of optimism mm. that seems absolutely unattackable. Whereas what has actually happened in this civilization, as I say, since about um, 1770, is that we've gone in the opposite direction and tended to go down and down and down. Mm. Now, um, once you recognize that, in fact, what you've got are two people in your brain, um, Stan and Ollie, and that once uh, you recognize this, there are some mornings when things seem to go wrong, you know, um, and 
Ollie, who is the intellectual of the two in a way, let's say he cuts himself while shaving, and then, you know, he going out of the front door, falls over the doorstep and all the rest of it. And he thinks, oh, God, it's just one of those days. As soon as you think, oh, God, it's just one of those days. It's going to be one of those days. Uh, stuff's yeah. going wrong. Oh, well, yeah. We're going to have to get into this a bit deeper after the, after the break. Oh. I mean, because, you know, sure. unfortunately, those things come along every now and then. Um, I want to get a little bit deeper into this and, and see what else there is to it, because it's such fascinating stuff. It affects us all. So join me after the break when we're back with Colin Wilson. Um, for example, uh, a man uh, called Raymond Dart, who was um, a naturalist, was talking um, with a man called Robert Ardrey, um, who was also very interested in the subject. They went past a branch that appeared to have an extremely beautiful um, flower on the branch. Dart waved his hand over this branch, which immediately dissolved into a little flight of tiny flies which buzzed all around the place then they all resettled on this branch which actually proved to be a completely dead piece of wood crawled over one another's backs and formed on the branch a, an absolutely perfect um, flower which was green at the tip as it would be and so on <laughs> and all of the rest looked absolutely marvelous yeah. and uh, now I asked um, Julian Huxley who's a biologist yeah. Um, what, um, how this could happen in the evolutionary sense. And he said he didn't know, he couldn't see any possible mechanism that would enable a whole colony of yeah. these things. Yeah. You see, evolution happens in the sense of individuals. Yeah. You know, a giraffe strives hard, harder and harder, and it's supposed to generate a longer neck, but it's just an individual giraffe. Mm. You can't, if you've got a whole colony of a thousand sort of little insects, suddenly turn them into... A perfect yeah. plant. There's some connection somewhere, isn't there? There's a rather weird connection, yeah. yes. Yeah. And it's, it's as if there's some kind of lord of the ants or of mm. the flies or whatever mm. we're looking at. Some kind of overarching frequency ratio, whatever you want to yep. call it, that, that, that pulls all these things together. That's right. In, yeah. And what we've got to do in some funny way is to tune in. And that's peak experience, frequency. isn't it? It's kind of tuning in to yep. this greater thing, whatever it is whatever you want to call it, this greater frequency. I mean, at the end of the day, thoughts are frequencies, aren't they? They're waveforms. <laughs> you see, I think, as far as I'm concerned, my great advantage has always been that I've been a very cheerful kind of individual. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so you've uh, had many peak experiences. Yeah. So Could you tell us about one of them? Um, well, um, I can certainly tell you about the way that I've noticed the way that um, it appears to happen. Um, one evening, my wife and I were driving back home from the local pub and uh, where we used to go and have a sort of glass of wine and a sandwich at about six o'clock. And I said to her, you know, we take it for granted this car will get us home and that everything will be OK, but we don't really bother to think that things could go wrong. And as I began to say this to her, the car went slower and slower and slower and it stopped. <laughs> and so I got out and... It sort of lifted up the bonnet and poked around and all the rest of it. Couldn't see anything at all wrong with it. And finally, another car came along the road and I signalled him to a stop and said, would he give my wife a lift home? And uh, because he was going that way. And off he went with her. And uh, I stayed on. She came back in due course with our Land Rover and some thick ropes. And we hauled the car along home. Yeah. Well, when the garage looked at it on the following Monday morning, they said, it's funny. We've never seen this fault before. It's a completely rare thing. Right. But as far as I was concerned, I could see that m the words I'd said to her, we take it for granted that this car will get us home, but perhaps it won't. Mm. And it was as if as it were, someone overheard me said, OK, we'll demonstrate it. Mm. And what it demonstrated for me, of course, because there was no real damage done. We were home a mere 20 minutes later than we would have been normally. Yeah. What it merely demonstrated was that there appears to be some force in the universe which does take notice of these kind of things and can actually change them. Mm. Now, now that we're living in this particular time when it looks as if things are incredibly bad, 
I've got a feeling once again that if, in fact, this could be grasped, we could, as it were, generate a whole movement mm. where we could do it with our minds alone. Mm. And of course, someone like you is in an ideal position to do it because you exercise such influence over so many people. Well, <laughs> not the wife. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, I do agree. I think it's time, personally, you know, I, mean, I, I veer away from giving personal opinions or try to, but my personal opinion is that it's time for a big moral shift. Mm. You know, that we've, we've allowed people, and we've allowed concepts such as greed, etc., to have too much of a hold on us as a society as a whole and it's time to start listening maybe to that true self that we were talking about earlier the intuitive side of ourselves what do you think do you think it's time to get back to this utopian idea yep i i fortunately have never been terribly involved in that because as a writer i've never made much money i was being sort of <laughs> right surprise <laughs> yeah, i agree with you and uh, and therefore you know it's uh, Oh, I've always had an overdraft. I haven't got one at the moment, believe it or not. Mm. But um, we've always had an overdraft. And um, we take it for granted that things will work out OK. Mm. And it's, I'm sure this basic belief that things will work out OK, yeah. that's, the, um, that's the answer to this. Right. Indeed. Fascinating. I mean, there's, there's obviously there are waves and peaks and troughs of, of good, feel-good factors. I mean, you know, America yeah. with Obama coming in has got this little wave of a feel-good factor going off. But mm. there's also a negative side to it. I mean, you know, anybody who sees on YouTube and sees the a film, the Obama deception, that's doing the rounds. Mm. You know, already that opposite side of the coin, that Laurel and Hardy, mm. in the society is coming out. So do you think, I mean, my point I'm trying to make is, what's going off in the individual? Do you think that's reflected in the society as a whole, like the, the bugs that turn in, that make the flower? I, I, is that the same kind of connection there? Well. I'm absolutely certain that there um, is a force outside us that causes the bugs to turn into flowers and that um, our main problem has for, for a very long time um, been to believe in this and to recognise its existence. Mm. It began to happen um, in the 19th century with this movement called Romanticism and it had gone dead by the end of the century and everyone was in a sort of mood of utter gloom and then it went worse and worse and worse with the First World War and then, as I say, Hemingway and the Wasteland and all the rest of mm. it. And now, as far as I can see, philosophy has never been in such a totally gloomy state <laughs> yes. as it is at the moment. <laughs> I, I must admit, I agree with you. I mean, I, I interviewed a, a philosopher not long ago, um, quite a leading philosopher. I'm not going to mention his name, but um, we've got that in the can. And I came away from that gloomy. Mm. I was... You know, if I had to sit there all day thinking those thoughts, I might as well do what a lot of people that you've spoken of in, the, in your book, <laughs> kill myself. Mm. You know, oh, well, it's, none of it's worth anything. It's all a waste of time, etc., etc. You know, philosophy to me is getting people to actually think for themselves, not telling them to start thinking gloomy thoughts, you know. Um, well, but what do we mean by self? Do you have a, an opinion on what the true self is? Well, um, when I started writing The Outsider, it was partly because I was fascinated by the suicide rate in yeah. the 19th century, that so many people had killed themselves. And then when you looked at it more closely, you could suddenly see that the reason the suicide rate was so high was that you got a particular kind of conflict. Van Gogh... Um, painted a picture called The Starry Night, yeah. which shows the whole sky exploding yeah. with stars all over the place. There's such insight in that yeah. painting, isn't there? And it seems yeah. to be absolutely positive. And yet, six months later, he killed himself yeah. and left behind a note that read, Misery will never end. Well, it's perfectly obvious that it was Van Gogh who, in a way, decided that misery will never end. Mm. And what's more, if the silly sod had hung on for another <laughs> year... Everything began to change. Yeah. So it there's a good message for everybody, though, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely brilliant message. Mm. You know, we're all capable of doing such wonderful things, like Van Gogh, who, who did some tremendous paintings with a lot of depth to them. Um, but then can also flip to the other side. And we've all got to be careful to keep the positive going as well. Do you think? Yep, I've always recognised this um, this fact that it depends upon one's own mind and also upon, as you say, tuning in um, to a feeling of positiveness um, in the time that you're living. Mm. 
you know, it's actually around us in a way, uh, is in the air. Mm. And um, it's not sort of too difficult to do. Years ago, I began doing it on long train journeys, putting myself into this state of mind and deliberately keeping it going and seeing how long it could be kept going for. Well, um, I'm nearly 88 at the moment. No, I'm not in 78. And uh, years of doing this have gradually taught me the way to do it. Mm. And I'm convinced that this is the basic answer. <laughs> it's possible, of course, to be wrong about that. <laughs> Bernard Shaw said that um, he believed he was well on the way to living to be 300, which was always my ambition. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, he died at 93. That's not bad. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's really pretty good. In fact, I would be fairly satisfied. I'd be satisfied to get to, to 78. <laughs> I'd be yeah. satisfied to get to 40 in a few days. But we've got less than a minute. Do you have one final message that you'd like the people to take home? Um, only that basically... Um, free will actually does exist. And that um, the reason that you rec recognise this is that whenever you are forced to do something with a certain determination, you can suddenly become aware of a feeling inside yourself of freedom. Mm. Freedom is something that you can increase um, by simply concentrating hard and expanding it quite deliberately. Mm. And um, I've always found, you know, that if I get into these negative states, it's quite easy. There we go. Fantastic. We got right up to the last second yet again. Join <laughs> me again on Gardener's World when we'll have some more fantastic guests.